This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining this morning. Hope everyone had a nice uh, Halloween weekend. It is my pleasure to uh, introduce one of our own, Dr. Olga Tolova, who is an associate professor who has uh, just joined us this year. Uh, it, it's amazing, uh, Olga made this move from Canada in the middle of the pandemic. And as I recall, she did all of her Zoom interviews and purchasing a house and all of that, <laughs> and the, coordinating the move to Atlanta virtually, <laughs> or, or a lot of it virtually. Um, we're very fortunate to have her here at Emory. Um, she's of course going to talk about a topic that's uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, a little bit about uh, Dr. Tolova, she graduated from Bulgaria and did a family medicine residency at University of British Columbia in Vancouver, and then uh, did her internal medicine uh, residency and general cards at University of Alberta. Uh, and she also completed an MPH uh, at Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, uh, she practiced at University of Manitoba and at St. Boniface Hospital for about seven years, uh, doing a TAVR as well as the developing her coronary physiology uh, program there. And uh, so we're very fortunate that we were able to uh, recruit her here when, um, uh, because uh, Dr. Habib Samadi left. And so I was wondering what was gonna happen, who was gonna help me with functional testing. And I'm uh, thrilled that uh, she decided to come to Emory. So I'll uh, turn it over to uh, her and uh, she's going to talk to us about some uh, new things that uh, have started happening at Emory uh, related to coronary physiology. Thank you, Pooja. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thanks for uh, waking up so early after um, a bit of a disappointing night last night uh, for the Braves, but still keep the hopes. Uh, this morning, I'm going to present uh, some uh, interesting data about uh, how we assess microvascular dysfunction. We'll talk a little bit about angina with open coronaries. Um, without further ado, we will proceed uh, with um, I have nothing to disclose. The objectives of the talk today are um, to speak about uh, the etiology of angina with open coronaries, how to make the diagnosis with functional angiogram, what are the different endotypes of functional coronary artery disease, and um, an algorithm of assessment that I've put together. I was very uh, uh, enthusiastic to show you some of the first cases I've done here, and we'll talk about both Doppler and uh, thermodilution uh, methods of uh, evaluation. Uh, of course, I'm gonna start with the case. Uh, it was uh, a patient who uh, was a 54-year-old male. Um, as you could see, uh, not all the patients who have open coronaries are uh, female. Uh, and uh, I have to say that in our practice here, uh, it's almost, half and half. Uh, so this gentleman was referred to uh, us to assess for stable angina. He had previously um, uh, symptoms for about a year or so, had an angiogram at another facility that uh, showed no uh, significant coronary artery disease and uh, was uh, requested that we perform a coronary physiology testing. Upon uh, our angiogram, we thought that there was some dampening in the left main, and we suspected maybe an osteo left main stenosis. Uh, at this point, uh, we gave nitroglycerin, we disengaged our catheter, and you could see here, obviously, there is an osteo left main after a, a generous amount of intracoronary nitroglycerin. We performed measurements. Um, uh, which is always very challenging when uh, it's an osteo lesion, but we identified that uh, during um, the rest, uh, there is uh, IFR of 0 0.59, which uh, was quite concerning about severe uh, osteo left main stenosis. After discussion with the patient, heart team, uh, the patient's referring physician, we decided that uh, we will proceed with the stenting on the second sitting uh, and open up the artery. The patient was not um, opposed to left main stenting versus uh, coronary artery bypass grafting in this uh, uh, low syntax core situation. We stented the vessel, uh, we performed IVUS uh, to optimize and uh, physiology post uh, showed uh, basically uh, non-obstructive um, uh, physiology. 
So we were very happy that uh, the case was successful. Uh, the patient was discharged home. Um, and uh, I'll tell you what happened afterwards. So I want to briefly talk about uh, what we are all very used to, which is a coronary angiogram assessment of um, uh, epicardial stenosis, as well as physiology assessment of those stenosis with fractional flow reserve, and more recently with the more modern technology of um, uh, doing um, assessment during rest. So uh, what we'll actually do with our coronary wires is uh, we position them across the stenosis and uh, we measure pressure uh, proximal and distal to the stenosis to estimate the resistance in the area that we visualize on the coronary angiogram. The reality is that um, uh, nowadays uh, we have developed uh, techniques where we don't need to use uh, maximum vasodilatation to estimate whether this lesion is causing a problem and needs a stent or a bypass, uh, which is uh, uh, what we call resting indices. And there is multiple um, new uh, ones out there. RFR is the Abbott one. There is IFR that you're all familiar with. And I'll show you a graph of this. Uh, but if we want to do the classical old-fashioned way and assess the patients during dynamic exercise or um, vasodilatation, we then apply adenosine, which helps us vasodilate the system and shows us how the patients compensate with the stenosis during exercise. What adenosine does is it wipes out all the micro uh, circulation and the capillaries and leaves us with the impression of what happens in the true microcirculation and arterioles, which are about 25 to 35% of the resistance measured uh, in the system. So really when we do an FFR, our eyes are on the epicardial vessels and it does um, uh, as a simple calculation. We know uh, there is a lot of data on uh, a number of less than 0 0.8, uh, considering it significant and uh, making us inclined to uh, stent. Uh, and if it's more, then uh, defer the PCI and continue on with medical therapy. This is a, a summary of uh, the available out there technologies nowadays where we don't need to use adenosine, but just directly measure during the uh, resting phase. And also uh, these have been very well correlated with FFR and long-term outcomes for which um, uh, we just uh, reduced the risk of using um, a vasoactive agents like adenosine that could have some significant side effects to the patients. So in summary, fractional flow reserve and RFR are uh, two measures that help us estimate uh, the severity and the significance of epicardial stenosis. RFR determines the resistance across the stenosis and ignores the microcirculation, where FFR determines the resistance when uh, basically includes the microcirculation and the way to uh, activate it is by giving adenosine. As I said, there's multiple studies about epicardial disease and uh, we are quite comfortable utilizing it in day-to-day -day practice uh, to whether uh, defer or uh, not when it comes to um, a stenting of these vessels. Uh, but what it is when uh, we actually don't see any lesions, how do we um, assess the patients then? Um, we do an angiogram, we rely on our eyes, uh, and if we see irregularity or moderate lesion, then we have FFR or RFR. But if we see pristinely open arteries, how do we then explain the patient's symptoms? We know for many years that there is uh, vasospastic disease, which uh, accounts for uh, Prince metal angina and Takotsubo, and also microvascular disease. And these uh, not always are easily uh, visible uh, by the eye for us to trigger uh, further investigations. So this is the difference between ba what basic coronary physiology does. Uh, it estimates the epicardial stenosis and measures it. But if we see normal arteries, what we actually don't see is a huge network of capillaries and microvessels that uh, we need to find a way to evaluate. What you don't see could be assessed by non-invasive methods and uh, we have um, at our hands cardiac MRI uh, that could potentially help us assessing absolute flow. 
cardiac PET scan, and nowadays uh, coronary physiology with either Doppler or thermodilutional wires. So we have expanded our horizons beyond our eyes. We have uh, opportunity to um, explain the symptoms or um, objective findings of ischemia in these patients. Uh, when uh, do we um, call for the diagnosis of functional coronary artery disease? I know the uh, original presentation was named microvascular dysfunction, but the reality is that there are multiple entities or multiple endotypes within this basket of um, functional coronary artery disease. And the community is trying really hard right now to um, elaborate a strict um, rules of how to put patients into different categories and how to make the diagnosis and what are the accurate terminologies for when we make the diagnosis of these patients. So in general, uh, there are some uh, terms out there like uh, ischemia with non-obstructive coronary artery disease. We often use uh, the term ENOCA. MINOCA, when there is a myocardial infarction and uh, no obstructive coronaries or normal appearing coronaries, uh, slow flow syndromes, no reflow phenomena, and takotsubo. On top of it, epicardial vasospasm, microvascular spasm, and, micro, uh, and myocardial bridge. All of these are uh, potential uh, causes for angina or ischemia, and uh, the uh, epicardial vessels may appear completely normal. What we are interested in though, is that uh, uh, we want to really focus on the patients who have um, open arteries that appear normal and continue to experience angina. And uh, this is what we call a type one um, functional coronary artery disease or microvascular dysfunction. We know that there are other causes that uh, could potentially lead to angina with open arteries like hypertrophic cardiomyopathies or disease of the myocardium. Uh, in uh, obstructive coronary artery disease, there could be endothelial dysfunction or no reflow phenomena in patients uh, who had uh, acute MI or recent PCI. So really uh, the biggest mystery have been the ones that had only risk factors and don't have any of the other entities to explain why uh, the patient is having angina. We know that uh, there are certain um, factors in the environment that could potentially predict uh, microvascular dysfunction or endothelial dysfunction and uh, any um, pro-atherogenic factors like hyperlipidemia, diabetes, uh, or hypertension could potentially affect uh, the blood vessels and, and cause ischemia. There's uh, issues specifically related to uh, sex and that's hypoestrogenemia, uh, early menopause, uh, or perimenopausal states where the hormone um, in the body uh, fluctuates and may potentially provoke some of these uh, functional changes in the vessels as well. Uh, when should we consider functional CAD as a diagnosis? First of all, uh, these often are patients who, even though we uh, are used to label as atypical angina, they have exertional symptoms. It could be chest pain or shortness of breath, and also often they have abnormal stress tests. It could be a nuclear scan or a treadmill test. Uh, there are patients who have normal angiogram and sometimes have uh, repeated angiograms uh, that have been reassuring and telling them that there's nothing wrong with your arteries. But if there's only mild uh, disease or slow flow coupled with the symptoms, we should strongly consider microvascular disease or spasm. <laughs> Uh, it is indeed more commonly diagnosed in men, but there is some data out there that uh, maybe there is a bit of a referral bias for men, because often men uh, develop atherosclerosis earlier in their life, and uh, they could have this preceding uh, the thought of uh, maybe having functional disease on top of it. The patients experience debilitating symptoms. They have repeated evaluations for other competing causes for chest pain, like um, um, shortness of breath and visits to the respirologist or gastroenterologist for GERD. Uh, 
Um, patients who present with acute coronary syndrome and have non-obstructive coronary artery disease should be also considered um, as a Minoka patient or a SCAD patient. Slow flow documented on angiogram, Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, and patients with recurrent chest pain that is sounding ischemic should be also considered for this type of testing. Why should we care? Uh, well, first of all, we know that impaired coronary vascular function is associated with adverse outcomes. This was uh, shown in multiple trials uh, by the Noel Berry Mertz group and other groups, uh, suggesting that uh, reduced CFR is associated with poor cardiovascular outcomes in the short and long run, especially in women. Uh, these patients are significant burden on the healthcare system. They have recurrent ER visits. Uh, they have uh, multiple uh, doctor visits and uh, continue to experience debilitating symptoms, which of, of course affects their uh, uh, ability to work uh, uh, and their ability to cope in life and in general, their quality of life. Patients uh, are also given false reassurance. And if uh, we really uh, look into the data, we realize that they actually have poor outcomes and higher risk of uh, events in the future. Microvascular dysfunction appears in about 50% of patients with STEMI, which is associated with uh, microcirculatory um, um, plugage of microthrombi. Optimal treatment strategies are still uh, in a process of uh, learning and there is no randomized trials that really help us how to make uh, the best uh, for a certain diagnosis. So how do we assess and what is invasive physiology study? Uh, once you've decided that your patient may have functional coronary artery disease, uh, you uh, are interested in uh, doing something to understand uh, why uh, are they having an vagina or ischemia. Uh, there is uh, good access to um, cardiac PET uh, in our institution, so coronary flow reserve could be assessed uh, by that, which is uh, very helpful. Uh, but uh, there are certain parts of the comprehensive testing, like, um, uh, for example, uh, epicardial spasm that cannot be provoked during these non-invasive tests. So it really boils down to coming into the cath lab and doing a full comprehensive analysis of the vasculature. Um, the measurements could be done by uh, two different types of uh, systems. We used to use the Doppler flow uh, volcano wire. Um, and now uh, more recently, we um, adopted the coral flow, which is a thermodilutional method. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about it today by me showing you cases. So just to recap, when we um, assess uh, the coronary tree, there's three types of um, uh, vasculature that play a role in the uh, flow and the uh, ischemia, uh, potential ischemia. The conductance arteries, uh, which are the epicardial vessels, and then the resistance arteries, which includes the arterioles and the capillaries. And it all is by measuring resistance in these different vascular territories. And as you can see, the microvasculature occupies the biggest proportion of what uh, plays a role in the resistance. And the epicardial vessels are only 10% of this. So originally what we were more focused on was the coronary flow reserve. And uh, this uh, is something that uh, we could um, uh, talk about for hours of how the flow uh, decreases once there is uh, severe stenosis and uh, that the cutoff is around 70% for an epicardial vessel where the patient starts experiencing angina. And then when it comes close to 100% uh, of uh, epicardial stenosis, the, the flow is severely reduced even at rest. So coronary flow reserve is a good measure. Um, it uh, decreases with increased stenosis, uh, but we know that the culprit uh, to the decreasing of coronary flow reserve uh, could be due to uh, non-epicardial issues. So somewhere in the arterioles or microvasculature. So it's not microvascular specific and normal values are unclear depending on the method we used and it often is affected by the resting hemodynamics. So if the patient is in distress, uh, it could be affected. If there is adrenaline drive and tachycardia, if there is hypotension. So it's quite a, a dynamic uh, measure. 
And uh, I will show you how uh, we measure uh, coronary flow reserve uh, with uh, thermodilution. So uh, to measure basal flow, which is the resting flow, we use an injection of um, saline uh, that goes from um, the tip of the catheter to the microvasculature. And we measure time uh, by which this travels. Very similar to what we do when we do cardiac uh, output with the Swan-Gans catheter. Uh, the faster the blood travels, uh, the faster the temperature uh, decreases uh, distal to uh, where the thermistor is. And this uh, gives us an idea of uh, how the flow in the artery is during rest. We then give adenosine and uh, wipe out the effect of the capillaries and we measure time again to see how the microvasculature behaves. Because there is presumed vasodilatation and maximal flow in the microvascular resistance arteries at the time, we expect that the time uh, of uh, decrease of the temperature will be faster. And this uh, then uh, helps us decide of uh, the resistance in this um, circulation. So when we measure coronary flow reserve, it's a, a measure of the ability to increase flow to the heart when you need it. Uh, the CFR uh, is a very important uh, um, indicator of the uh, ability of your heart to respond to stress. But the major limitations for CFR assessment for the heart are that it's very dynamic, as I explained. Uh, and uh, when it's abnormal, you don't know why. Is it because you just induced pain by getting access to your femoral artery? Uh, is it because the patient is anxious? Uh, getting the procedure done, or is it because the blood pressure is uh, low because of sedation? So the reality is that it's very dynamic and sometimes low CFR could be certainly uh, caused not by heart disease, but other competing factors. Uh, we also know that uh, in uh, big, uh, the big uh, trial, WISE trial, and I know Pooja has been involved with this uh, research group for many years, um, uh, they showed that uh, when there is reduction in coronary flow reserve, uh, there is a significant long-term impact in women with uh, normal appearing coronaries. And you can see here that event-free uh, survival is um, different between the ones that had normal uh, coronary flow reserve and the patients with reduced coronary flow reserve, there definitely was increased events over the time. Uh, this was uh, published uh, and discussed uh, in, um, uh, at length uh, because we still don't understand what are the subtypes that carry worse prognosis. And in this paper from 2019, the group suggested that the patients who have uh, reduced um, CFR with adenosine, um, uh, they have uh, impaired microvascular dilatation, uh, and they are the ones that carry the high risk over time for increased cardiovascular events. There is also a group of patients who had um, an actual uh, vasospastic angina or uh, increased epicardial constriction, uh, which was induced by acetylcholine. And these patients had more anginal hospitalizations. But the two entities could coincide in the same patient or they could transition over time. So uh, even though we sometimes uh, feel reassured by the measurement of CFR, um, we still uh, may uh, sometimes uh, have the um, epicardial spasm as well on top of it. So I'm gonna go and talk a little bit about the types of uh, measurements that we do currently to assess the microcirculation. And for those of you that uh, have referred patients here at uh, um, Emory, um, in the past, the go-to um, invasive measurement was the Doppler wire by Volcano. And what it does is directly measures uh, the pressure uh, into uh, the circulation by, um, uh, for example, uh, measuring the flow under different uh, circumstances. And you could see here that when there is an epicardial stenosis and no microvasculature in the graph below uh, that is affected, once we open the stenosis, the CFR improves to normal. But in certain situations, the epicardial stenosis could coexist with microvascular impairment. And once we stent or uh, 
treat the stenosis, the flow could remain low and the patients may uh, continue to experience symptoms. So this is why it is important that uh, if they come back with recurrent episodes of pain and the stents are open and there's no other explanation for their angina, we have to look into the potential other culprits as to why is the patient experiencing these ischemic symptoms. As you could see here on this graph, when measuring CFR in the artery, arterial tree, we basically, it's a general measurement of all the three aspects of uh, circulation. So epicardial vessels, arterioles, and capillaries. So it really gives us a general look uh, and doesn't really pinpoint where exactly is the problem. Um, when we uh, look at um, what happens um, into the epicardial vessels, if we are to think about spasm, again, we have to use different agents to provoke that. So it becomes really complicated. And I like this slide from uh, uh, way back when, uh, uh, when uh, I was first learning about this and it was uh, Tara Sedlak, uh, who also trained with uh, Puja in the same program. She um, helped me understand, and this is what we came up with. Uh, there's two pathways by which uh, we test. Uh, one is the uh, endothelial dependent pathway and the um, drug that we use to test the reaction of the endothelium is acetylcholine. So if we see, uh, while we use acetylcholine, if there is vasoreactivity and spasm, we make a diagnosis of epicardial spasm, which is the top corner here. If we see reduced coronary blood flow or reproduction of symptoms or ECG changes, but no overt spasm in the epicardium, then we make a diagnosis of endothelial dysfunction or microvascular um, vasospasm. Once we go to the endothelial independent pathway, uh, the provoking factor is adenosine. And if we see reduced coronary flow reserve in response to adenosine or increased uh, intramyocardial resistance, then we make the diagnosis of non-endothelial um, pathway um, microvascular dysfunction. And if the patients uh, do not respond properly to nitroglycerin, then they also have an appropriate response um, to um, this pathway as well. But most of the times nitroglycerin is very potent and works really well. So this is how the Doppler wire works. Um, and I'm not gonna uh, trouble you with all the numbers and all the, st uh, the steps in the procedure, but it basically uh, it, the, the protocol involves intracoronary uh, adenosine biolysis and then direct measurements of the uh, blood flow and the blood vessel. And usually the blood vessel we utilize is the LED. Uh, and then we do the same with acetylcholine and uh, we basically uh, come up to the conclusion of uh, which one of the types that I showed you earlier is uh, the endotype that this particular patient has. I will show you a case uh, of um, one of the first ones that we did here, and it's just a, an example of, of what we do when, uh, when patients come. So this is a young woman that had previous angiograms uh, with epicardial disease and stenting. And you could see in the proximal LED, there is a stent and a little bit of a, what it looks to be a proximal uh, irregularity on the edge of the stent. Uh, but it doesn't look severe enough. So the treating physician uh, reassessed because the patient kept having recurrent chest pains uh, despite the stenting and uh, they did an IFR and IVUS and they felt that the uh, lesion is not significant uh, to uh, warrant extra stenting. So she was sent for microvascular testing um, to us. This is what happened when we first injected her, uh, her arteries, uh, like even at the entry site, uh, you could see that the femoral is very small and spastic and there was diffuse spasm um, in the, upon engagement of the left nail. We uh, had severe dampening, chest pain, ECG changes. So here we identified the severe spontaneous uh, epicardial spasm. Uh, and you could see the stent looking like um, a big giant um, <clears throat> foreign body within these very spastic arteries. This is what happened after we gave nitroglycerin. Everything opened up and looked really, really uh, back to what um, normal size would be. 
Um, we decided to test uh, with adenosine just to confirm that there is no microvascular impairment and uh, the patient had uh, uh, measurements that were consistent with normal CFR. Uh, and you could see here what happened to the leg artery once we gave the nitroglycerin. We concluded that the patient has severe spontaneous epicardial spasm. Uh, the, the lesion in the LED was moderate and just needed medical therapy. And we weren't sure about the beating in the proximal parts of the uh, uh, iliac artery. So she underwent uh, full screening for FMD, which came back negative. Uh, she responded well to diltiazem and SSRI, and the spasms were completely abolished. So just an example that at this uh, point, we didn't really need to provoke the spasm. It was pretty obvious. But in this case here, the patient um, was already diagnosed with reduced CFR in the past, was never given the full spasm dose, and we wanted to randomize her to a trial that treats specifically the non-endothelial dependent microvascular dysfunction uh, as it's expressed by low CFR. The cutoff with the Doppler wire is 2.3, so that's why we call this borderline. Uh, and then we decided that uh, we will come back and just have a look and see if uh, she actually would qualify for this randomized trial with the CD34. So this was her baseline, and this is what happened with the low dose at still calling. So what we normally do is we take a microcatheter and we infuse selectively into one of the arteries to avoid a generalized spasm as you, what you saw earlier in the spontaneous spasm patient. So that way, when we infuse the provoking agent, it's not the left main that's spasming out and shutting down the whole circulation, but it's just the distal LED. And you could see here that even with the small dose, uh, test dose, the patient already started to have a uh, reduction in the size of the LED. And then as we uh, went into the high dose, completely shut down the LED to almost no, not visible. Uh, so this reproduced her symptoms. And this is what happened after we applied nitroglycerin and uh, additionally gave adenosine. The artery came back to its full normal size. So these are just an example of how uh, we visualize spasm and how we abolish it uh, when we do the pr provocation testing. Um, the reality is that um, we um, you know, uh, do the measurements uh, and we have full control over uh, what happens. This is a, a flow sheet that I use when I do the measurements with um, uh, the thermodilutional wire. And again, uh, it just uh, shows you a calculation of how we come up with the measurements of IMR, which is uh, the measurement uh, that we use in, during thermodilution. So I'm gonna show you again um, as to why I think IMR is, is a good reliable measure. Um, and here you could see that uh, when we go to microcirculation, um, as you saw earlier, the CFR encompasses the epicardial and the microvasculature. The FFR focuses on the epicardial vessels, but the big proportion of the microvasculature remains unknown. So this is why um, measuring resistance with IMR helps us really focus on this big um, pool of arterioles that uh, could help us decide uh, on microvascular ischemia. This is how we do that with the um, um, wire that we have right now, which is the color flow. We put the wire into uh, the LED and then uh, we measure transit time. Uh, we know that uh, when IMR is high, the flow is reduced at the microcirculation level. Uh, and uh, this uh, is something that uh, by giving adenosine and removing the micro uh, capillaries from the equation helps us decide of how uh, the arterioles act. So here is uh, the measurement of hyperemia. And this time, um, could then be translated um, into IMR, uh, which is the lowest diastolic pressure mean, uh, times mean transit time in hyperemia and gives us this index of resistance. And um, again, just schematically presenting of how it works is the bolus the, that comes in is a cold saline that we inject through the tip of the guide and it's exact amount of three cc uh, and uh, it measures the change in temperature from the proximal to the distal part of this uh, thermistor. And that's 
how we assess the flow with IMR. Uh, it is really a snapshot. So we do three measurements when we do it. And uh, it, I usually do it under hyperemia. So the adenosine is still running as I'm doing. Um, and uh, usually that uh, gives me a good idea of the number without uh, being afraid that I've missed hyperemia. Whereas with the Doppler wire, when we do injections intracoronary, uh, sometimes it wears off pretty fast. And by the time we obtain a good signal, we may actually miss the, the, uh, the peak of hyperemia. So the core flow system is the one we use right now. We have it available at both uh, campuses uh, at St. Joseph's and at Emory, Maine. And uh, you could send patients to either whatever uh, place is convenient uh, for your referral uh, practice. Uh, they have validated certain numbers for the CFR of 2.0. So it's a bit different than the CFR measured by Doppler, which is 2.3. And IMR of less than 25 is considered um, normal and more than 25 abnormal. So uh, we make the diagnosis based on either or measurement, either reduce CFR all or increased IMR. Why is it good? Well, it is good because it gives us an idea about the epicardial vessels. Uh, so it gives epicardial assessment, it gives microvascular assessment and gives us some idea of how the, the ventricle is functioning. Uh, so it's a, it's a very comprehensive uh, system whereas most of the other hemodynamic systems, um, the Doppler is very cumbersome and difficult to use. Uh, and all the other FFR wires don't have the ability to do thermodilution and measure flow and resistance. This is the protocol I use. I'm not gonna spend much time. If you're interested, you can always refer to this, but it's, um, I basically do it identical to the Doppler wire. So that way if there's patients that have undergone the assessment with the Doppler, we could just adopt the, the information. The only big difference is that adenosine is given IV uh, during thermodilution uh, because it, you really have to reach a steady state and then you do an intracoronary injection with saline in order to measure the flow. And that cannot be done at the same time as giving intracoronary adenosine because it's very short lived. Everything else, uh, as far as the f choline dosages is the same as uh, the Doppler assessment. So here's what happened to that patient that I showed you earlier. Two months post PCI, he had some relief of his symptoms, but continued to have him, especially on um, uh, more sternness exertion. So we brought him back uh, and we took pictures and the stent was widely patent. But what he had was now uh, after removing the epicardial issue, he had microvascular dysfunction. So when we tested him with adenosine, you could see that his IMR was 41, very elevated, and CFR was 1.2. So we made a diagnosis of uh, microvascular dysfunction, non-endothelial pathway. And then we did at steel calling provocation. And with that, he also had reproduction of symptoms, elevated IMR and reduced CFR. Uh, and some beating of the vessels. So we um, started him on appropriate therapy, which would include um, addition of phrenolazine and um, beta blocker. So as you can see here, there's different cutoffs, but um, uh, the acetylcholine IMR has not been fully validated. This is work that I've done in Canada with uh, Dr. Miner's group. And you can see here that when we validated the cohort, we had there were different cutoffs, uh, cutoffs for IMR depending on the provoking agent. So the adenosine IMR remained to be more than 25, but the acetylcholine IMR in our uh, population was uh, cut off of 31, and we also used dobutamine. The reality is that if you look at the different types of patients within this, uh, they are also different uh, phenotypes. So the ones that had abnormal adenosine IMR were elevated BMI, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and older age. And those with abnormal acetylcholine IMR were predominantly male and had elevated uric acid. So it's just a snapshot of the fact that we still don't know uh, what all of these measurements meanings are and whatnot. 
And here is just a, a flow diagram of what I came up with uh, as far as how I make the diagnosis in, once I reach the, the stage of functional angiogram. So if you focus on the purple um, a square in the middle, once we've decided to refer someone for functional angiogram, uh, these are the endotypes that we could um, come up with as a diagnosis. So the ones that have reduced um, CFR and elevated IMR with a dentine. Okay. Okay. Um, are the ones that um, have non endothelial dependent microvascular angina. Uh, the ones that have um, normal CFR and normal IMR by adenosine probably have non cardiac chest pain or false positive stress test. And the ones that um, also um, have uh, no angina uh, come to this group, but there is a small proportion of them that would experience chest pain with the adenosine infusion, uh, despite the normal measurements that we obtain. And these are the ones that have increased cardiac nociception or adenosine hypersensitivity syndrome. And here on the right uh, is the acetylcholine pathway. And again, you could see that um, it's a separate and they could overlap, but the ones that have less than 90% spasm, and in some books, it's less than 70%, we make a diagnosis of endothelial dysfunction. Uh, and then the ones that have more than 90%, we make the diagnosis of epicardial vasospasm and so on and so forth. So it's just uh, a flow chart of how to approach these when we spit out all the measurements and do all the steps to make the diagnosis. Uh, the only trial to date that really kind of helped us uh, subdividing endotypes in, and then stratifying him, them to different therapies that are specific to them was the Cormica trial. It's the Colin Berry's group uh, from um, UK, and he has uh, been a trailblazer in uh, using thermodilution as measurements in coronary physiology. Uh, and what they did was uh, they took patients uh, that had suspe uh, sus were suspicious for possible functional coronary artery disease, and they divided them into two big endotypes, vasospastic angina and microvascular angina. So the ones that had vasospastic angina were stratified during acetylcholine testing, and they had either visible epicardial vasoconstriction or reproduction of their usual chest pain and ischemic changes during the acetylcholine infusion. The ones that have uh, microvascular angina were patients who were uh, stratified based on the Covadis criteria, and they had symptoms of myocardial ischemia, unobstructed coronary arteries, and microvascular dysfunction proven by either IMR, CFR, or microvascular spasm. So I'm gonna show you a flow diagram, which may make it easier to understand. Uh, but uh, there were also patients that uh, had normal findings and these were called non-cardiac uh, chest pain. And here's how they did it. So they took the non-obstructive patients, they first challenged them with adenosine, the ones that had normal CFR and IMR proceeded to uh, the acetylcholine challenge. And if there was vasospasm, there was vasospastic angina. And these were the uh, treatments that they offered. The ones that had abnormal CFR with adenosine, so low CFR, high IMR, were still challenged with acetylcholine. And for some of them, if there was no overt epicardial spasm, but there were some changes that they uh, were seeing on ECG or reproduction of symptoms, they call them endothelial dysfunction or microvascular angina. And these were the treatments that were offered to them. And some of the patients had normal findings. And the interesting thing about the study is that the operators uh, were blinded to some of the findings of the microvasculature. Um, and so uh, based on your gestalt, when you know what uh, what you think this patient has. And then for some of the patients, they knew the findings of the microvascular therapy and just treated them based on the findings. It became evident that if you knew the microvascular type um, or the endotype and you coupled your therapies with the specific findings of these measurements of the functional cath, the patient had uh, greater relief of symptoms and uh, better quality of life. <laughs> 
but the overall outcomes between the blinded and the unblinded groups uh, overall at six months were 2.6%. So it was just uh, uh, the first trial that actually gave us a little bit more insight on the specific therapies based on the endotype we're treating and uh, gave us a bit more understanding that if we uh, do vasoactive testing and do proper measurements, we could then link specific therapies to these types and uh, at least improve angina and quality of life in these patients. Randomized trials for uh, long-term outcomes are still missing as far as treatments. So there's still a lot of work to be done. What we know so far is that if we have a microvascular dysfunction with low CFR and high IMR with adenosine, uh, the medications that we uh, recommend are renalazine and lifestyle changes. For acetylcholine-induced epicardial vasospasm, which is the endothelial pathway, uh, we do calcium channel blockers, long-acting nitrates, and SSRIs, smoking cessation. Prokinase inhibitors are only available in Japan, so we don't reach for those. And if we have an endothelial dysfunction, uh, but no epicardial spasm, then we go with beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, statin, and lifestyle changes. Adenosine hypersensitivity, so that's the increased nociception, are patients that uh, may benefit from imipramine and other uh, modification therapies. So this is a, the bucket of medications we know we can use in angina, but we're still um, working on coupling them with specific endotype and evidence that it really works beyond just the symptom control. So like I said, there's a lot of work to be done out there as far as randomized trials and learning how to do that. Um, at the end of the day, uh, some people will say, well, you still, uh, it's a bucket of meds and you just throw uh, one or the other at them. And if it doesn't work, you change and try something else. But I think we've reached the point where we know that certain drugs, uh, for example, renalazine is very specific to the microvasculature and then beta blockers, specifically in the bivolo, works on endothelial function um, and whatnot. Uh, so uh, we could probably avoid multiple meds uh, thrown at the same time and potentially risking side effects and QT prolongation and be more specific. And I truly believe that uh, we are on um, the verge of uh, discovering um, you know, really more precise therapies and, and better outcomes for our patients. So in summary, uh, the presentations of functional coronary artery disease vary from stable angina to acute MI, non-invasive testing um, with MRI and PET uh, or functional angiogram with CFR, IMR, and FFR are very helpful to identify ischemia and the cause for patient symptoms. Microvascular dysfunction and endothelial dysfunction can affect both CFR and IMR and can present with multiple endotypes. We can use both Doppler or thermodilution methods. Um, currently, uh, we have both available uh, here at Emory. And that, uh, at the end of the day, uh, coronary provocation testing increases the certainty of the diagnosis of functional coronary artery disease and the quality of life of these patients could be improved by giving them the appropriate therapies. Randomized trials are still needed to really uh, go further into outcomes uh, of these patients based on therapies and endotype. And I just like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Mehta for her ongoing support and partnership at Emory since I arrived. She has been uh, my uh, real partner in uh, uh, establishing the program and making it happen here. Uh, and also Dr. Ziad Ali and Alan Jeremias from St. Francis, who had helped me with ideas and insights on how to do the, the coral flow. And uh, of course, Stephen Miner, who was my mentor in Canada and uh, gave me the first insights on thermal dilution. And I could take questions now. Thank you, Dr. Tolova, for that excellent uh, presentation and review of coronary physiology. Um, I really like the cases and uh, just kind of reminding myself of all the wonderful um, physiology. Uh, also, congratulations that you have been able to uh, start a core flow here. You've only been here six months, uh, and I, I believe we're the first uh, one in Georgia. Is that right? 
Yeah, that is right. Uh, uh, we have been probably at about 20 or 25 patients so far, and Dr. Samadhi uh, is starting his site, but still is not up and running as of last week. That's great. And um, just so, uh, you know, for those of you who are on um, coronary physiology testing in general, there are very few centers in the country that do it, uh, do it well, uh, and know how to interpret it. Uh, it can be quite challenging. And even though, you know, in presentations, we try to put people in buckets, you know, we say microvascular angina versus vasospastic angina, we try to define these pathways, but the reality is that there's so much overlap and often uh, what's helpful with uh, invasive testing is to try to help clarify and provide some explanation, uh, but there's a lot of work to be done. And uh, I'm gonna start off with a question while you guys are thinking of uh, your questions. Um, in the Cormica trial, you know, they make it seem uh, simple in terms of there's the vasospastic, if, if you see epicardial spasm, and then there's the microvascular that they defined as abnormal uh, IMR versus uh, CFR. What, what endotype uh, were patients who have microvascular spasm? Where did they fit in? Did they get the beta blocker or the calcium channel blocker? Yeah, so those ones actually fit into the endothelial dysfunction, but uh, the reality is that like, if you look at the, their diagram, I'm just going back to it, is they also, for those, uh, so uh, recommended that um, uh, they would uh, get the um, uh, long-acting nitrate and calcium channel blocker. You cannot see it unless you go into the uh, appendix of the, of the actual paper to read about it. And I know it is perplexing because there is a lot of um, conflict as to when you see ECG changes in reproduction of symptoms with acetylcholine, do you call this microvascular spasm or do you call it endothelial dysfunction, right? Right. Yeah. Well, um, the other issue is that with spasm, uh, yes, there's smooth muscle hyperactivity, but uh, you know, depending on the acetylcholine dose, it could also be endothelial dysfunction. So often uh, in practice, you know, people who have a lot of vasospasm, I do uh, put them on an ACE inhibitor if their blood pressure can tolerate it, because I think it does have positive endothelial effects. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, and then the other, the other very interesting um, drug that uh, plays a role here is nebivolol. And I know some of us are very comfortable using it uh, uh, for, um, you know, the part of endothelial dysfunction. But uh, I believe that in some of these microvascular spasm patients, which to me, they're just pure endothelial dysfunction, would play, uh, would play a role. Uh, and this is just, again, mm -hmm. a trial and error uh, situation, but uh, I feel that uh, the, um, the microvascular spasm uh, is just um, the early stage of what someone with endothelial dysfunction will have. We just uh, uh, anecdotally of what I've seen is it's not always elevated IMR or it's not always uh, reduced CFR. It could be both. Um, so there's still work to be done to understand this particular entity. Mm -hmm. The issue with nabivalol is uh, lately I've had a lot of uh, people just get denied <laughs> because oh, we yeah. have other beta blockers before the insurance will cover it. Uh, there's a question from Dr. Smith uh, regarding microvascular dysfunction. Potential drug therapies were mentioned. Uh, this is a great question. What about the SGLT2 inhibitors? And then uh, what the role does exercise play? So uh, it is, this is a very good question. And then there's been a lot of talk about these drugs now and their role into um, overall long-term outcomes. Uh, and um, there is a big initiative now um, across the country called the Microvascular Dysfunction Network, where we're actually trying to uh, actively follow patients in registries and see for the ones that we know they have a diagnosis of microvascular dysfunction and have been put on the medication uh, for other reasons, whether they have some relief of symptoms. So uh, there is hope uh, for this. There's hope for CD34 as well. Uh, you know, Puja, we've been trying really hard to uh, enroll mm -hmm. patients for this. 
Um, how does exercise work? Well, um, I believe that uh, overall uh, it uh, helps with adaptation of the microvasculature to, um, for some of those patients that uh, are persistently constricted to naturally release nitric oxide and, uh, and adapt to, um, to exercise. This is one of the theories. Mm -hmm. Um, Dr. Smith, you know, in terms of exercise, we know that it helps endothelial dysfunction and of course, overall kind of functional status and, you know, lifestyles, risk factors, et cetera, but specifically objective measure of whether coronary blood flow is changing with and without exercise, uh, that there are very small studies. And so I had pitched to the NHLBI a randomized controlled trial with cardiac rehab in, in measuring microvascular flow changes. And of course it wasn't funded. <laughs> and this goes along with the same thing related to HEFPAF. You know, the diagnosis of HEFPAF doesn't qualify you for cardiac rehab, uh, but uh, for microvascular patients, if they have, if we say that they have angina, then that angina diagnosis, it seems like that is covered. And so I've had patients, you know, be referred to cardiac rehab just because of angina, even if they didn't have uh, coronary stenting. And, and I have to say uh, that most of the time these patients have some um, uh, objective finding of ischemia outside of the microvascular testing in the lab. I haven't had any issues with them being approved for cardiac rehab as well. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? This is some of the most challenging group of patients. And one last thing to add is that there are also non-pharmacologic approaches that we're exploring. So, you know, there's some, some subgroup of this patient has a problem with the pain, uh, and it's a, it's a purely kind of, um, we, we kind of don't understand <laughs> a lot of what causes myocardial pain that's persistent, but, uh, you know, using things such as spinal cord stimulator, TENS, uh, SSRIs, as uh, Olga has mentioned, they're, they're, you know, working closely with the anesthesiology group for patients who clearly don't respond to our traditional and non-traditional anti-anginal meds, uh, that's been very helpful as well. So um, it's, it's a quite complex group of patients. And the best thing is to try to figure out, uh, you know, which subgroup they fit in, because some of them clearly respond, uh, you know, once you start uh, treating them, and then you'll prevent uh, emergency room visits and repeated um, doctor visits and repeated angiograms. Yeah, and then the issue with uh, with finding someone that could help you with uh, this particular uh, pain syndrome or um, alternative therapies is very complex. So it's we're still in the process of really uh, learning about the collaboration, finding uh, people that could help us with um, um, especially spinal cord stimulation insertion and whatnot is a bit more challenging. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we're at 8.30, so I will uh, go ahead and close if there are no other questions. Thank you again, uh, Olga, for reviewing that uh, coronary physiology for us. And thank you all of you for joining. Uh, don't forget your CME, and I will see you next week. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.